Hi again, and here we are starting chapter 11. This is dealing with signal transduction, the idea of, of sending signals between and through cells. This is about information flow, but it is also fundamentally about biochemistry. Biochemistry is the language of the cell. And so we're going to be looking at um, how we can change protein function, and that's fundamentally enzymatics and biochemistry. So it feeds into what we've talked about before, but now we're putting it into a signaling paradigm where we start with a receptor and a first message. Sometimes they call the primary message. We're going to have events inside the cell leading to responses and we can have cytosolic what we call cellular responses here fast cytosolic responses or slow genetic responses many times for students signal transduction is a big black box because there's certainly no shortage of scary figures in signal transduction but it is a very very simple paradigm of perception getting that information to the appropriate responding elements in the cell, leading to a response of some kind. And this link right here, if you uh, can copy and paste, is, is a wonderful resource for you um, if, um, if my presentation of the material is uh, not sufficient. Uh, I'm not afraid to, to, to send you in a direction that, that could be more helpful to you if, if, it, if it serves. Here are the reading. We're not doing the entire chapter this time around. Uh, we have uh, some very, very specific pages here in the 11th edition, or if you happen to have the 10th out there. In any case, make sure these are the pages that you cover, leading up to cyclic AMP and signaling efficiency. We're not going to cover signaling efficiency all that much. We're just trying to get the fundamental elements of signal transduction and show you some examples of each of the, the elements of understanding cellular messaging between cells and within cells can lead to uh, a, a wonderful appreciation for things like development. This is a, a, an embryo, and you can see different markers in different regions of the cell. This is all in direct connection to cellular messaging, the, the cells talking to each other and the signaling within those cells. We have cell-to-cell -cell communication. We also have intracellular communication, and we have found some basic mechanisms that, that span species. We see some basic commonalities from the most primitive unicellular organisms up to the most complicated multicellular ones. The main signaling paradigm, that's not entirely true if you think about neurons and that sort of a thing, is chemical signals. But even neurons talk to each other through chemical messages. Yes, they signal electrically long distances, but when it comes from neuron to neuron, most of the time we're talking about chemical signals. An example of a, of, a, of a signal that leads to multiple different cell responses and, and systemic changes in the body would be something like epinephrine, what we call adrenaline. When epinephrine is secreted by the, uh, by the adrenal gland, it can lead to all kinds of cellular changes throughout the body from the liver. The liver starts mobilizing glucose, blood vessels start constricting on the surface of your body, your heart rate goes up. Let's look at a few of these possibilities. Over here on the left, what we call the sympathetic responses, the sympathetic nervous system, but also adrenaline, causes the heart to pump faster, and that's a cellular response. The heart is beating faster, but it's due to changes of cellular signaling inside the cells that regulate heart rate and strength of contraction. We don't want to be digesting during uh, a stressful time. Uh, this is a time to be mobilizing for battle, if you know what I mean. So we'll slow down cellular activity in the digestive tract. We'll increase rate and depth of breath, breathing. Our pupils dilate. Lots of possibilities here. Uh, and they're, they're all predicated generally on one or two different signals that uh, the cells receive. Looking at something relatively simple like this or something incredibly complicated, it's always the same story. We have a primary message. Often it's a chemical. Not always, but often. We have a receptor. A lot of the time that receptor is found in the surface of a membrane, whether it's the membrane of the cell or sometimes an organelle in some cases. 
Sometimes it's in the cytosol, sometimes it's in the nucleus, but we have to have a receptor. Otherwise, the cell will not perceive the first message. We often will have second messages. That's when the receptor receives its signal, it has to get a signal to the effectors. We have second messages. We often even have some physical interactions in some cases. And again, thirdly, we have the responses, whether they're fast in the cytosol or an organelle, or they're slow in terms of changing what genes and proteins are created by the cell. So we have some kind of a signal, or perhaps it's an environmental change, like for instance, a change in temperature or a change in pH, etc. We get a response, and the linking between those two is the transduction. So here are a couple of examples. You know that I've mentioned fast cytosolic responses and slow genetic responses. Well, this figure at the top here is an example of where we have something binding and it's causing the plasma membrane to pinch and create a vesicle. This is a fast cytosolic response. We don't have to express new proteins. We're just changing the behavior of the proteins that are already there to pinch off and create a vesicle. This is called receptor-mediated endocytosis, by the way, but it is still signal transduction. We have a signal, we're causing proteins to change their behaviors, and they pinch off and create a vesicle. On the other hand, we have a signal being cre created by a quote-unquote producer cell here. Um, it's a chemical message, binds a receptor, we get a signal transduction. That leads to changes in gene expression, changes in what proteins are, are, are created or what proteins aren't created. And those proteins then go out into the cell, or maybe they're secreted. They go out into the cell and they do their thing. That's a, called a slow genetic response. Let you in on a little secret. Most of the time it's both. But in this class, I want you thinking about what's the most likely response. So most of the time it's both. Usually we get a little bit of cytosolic response and some genetic response with any signal. But nevertheless, I am going to want you to hedge your bets a little bit. That is to say, if we see a certain type of receptor, what's the most likely thing that we know is going to happen? Okay, Is it going to be fast or is it going to be slow? We know that cell signaling has evolved as uh, uh, throughout time. We find very, very primitive forms of cell signaling occurring in unis unicellular organisms. A really, really interesting one is in yeast. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which, by the way, is very important for brewing beer. If you have two what we call A-type cells as opposed to alpha, they will interact with each other, but they will not undergo a mating behavior uh, uh, response. So if two A's bump into each other, they can recognize each other as A and A. However, if an A encounters an alpha, which is the Greek letter A, alpha, they have different messages on the surface of their, uh, the outside of their, of their cells, outside their cell walls. Those react with receptors and will trigger a change in behavior in those cells to where they will fuse and exchange genetic information. This is a mating uh, response to signals, the A signal to the alpha and the alpha signal to the A, leading to, to changes in the plasma membrane and a fusion so that they can share genetic material. But only cells of different mating types can do this. Otherwise, this will not happen. So this has to involve signal transduction. And we define signal transduction, a series of steps where information leads to a change in the cellular behavior. Most of the time we're talking about biochemistry. Change in cellular behavior is a change in protein behavior. So we create a response to a signal, an informational event. And this is just a picture from your book, that only A's and alphas will do this. A's and A's or alphas and alphas will not do this. And it's secreting a factor that binds a receptor that causes a fast cytosolic response, leading to fusion of the two, uh, the two uh, different cell types. And we get this diploid type uh, cell that will then split off after the genetic crossover has occurred. 
And we see this across species from one end of the spectrum to the other, from the most primitive single-celled um, uh, organisms to the most complex multicellular organisms. For instance, and I uh, mentioned this in, uh, in our class, was that um, bacteria can sense population density. It's, they can tell how many other bacteria are around them. So when the population is relatively low, they tend to use uh, oxidative phosphorylation and other types of uh, metabolic activity. But when there are more, they will switch to a more aggressive and less efficient. That is to say, they are going to hog those energy molecules and they will produce uh, a biofilm and toxins that are that are um, that are harmful to um, ceramic and teeth. More acid, and it, it dissolves teeth away. That's why we get gum disease and, and tooth decay when we have persistently high populations of um, oral bacteria. If we're going to talk about signaling, we also have to talk about the distance of signaling. We have what's called local which is within a few cell diameters, usually less than five, uh, five to 10 cell diameters. And we have what's called long distance, which is more than 10 cell diameters, requires long distance diffusion or long distance types of signaling to occur. Uh, but we can have exceptionally long distance signaling in case of um, in case of intraorganismal signaling, like for instance, in insects, that long distance signaling can encompass many miles. So we have a huge range of distances. So we're going to talk about some of the categories that we see. Uh, and again, to facilitate conversation down the line when you're trying to understand uh, organ uh, function and cells within organ systems and so forth. So they, most multicellular organisms, we're talking about chemical messages. There are, it's not entirely chemical messages. Sometimes there are other ones, but most of the time we're talking chemical. Okay, so we can almost just say, just, we can just kind of assume that's going to be chemical, except in rare situations. One of the shortest distance signaling, the most uh, local, would be what we would call a direct cytoplasmic connection between adjacent cells. So we have a direct cytoplasmic connection. In humans, we call those connections gap junctions. Those are very, very local. Uh, in some cases, we'll have diffusional events, like for instance, we've got a cell here that's secreting signal and there are target cells right around it. We call that paracrine signaling. Now this over here says synaptic signaling. In my book, this is also paracrine because it's very, very close signaling. The reason they, they break it out as different is because the kinetics of synapses is orders of magnitude faster than paracrine. Uh, we're talking about milliseconds. Okay, so it's a very, very specialized form of paracrine signaling. So we can have direct cytoplasmic connections. We can have very, very short local signaling in the form of paracrine signaling, or we can have more than uh, say five to 10 cell diameters, long distance signaling. Like for instance, maybe we secrete um, uh, a hormone from uh, say an area near your brain that goes all the way down to you know, your, uh, your big toe. That's that's truly long distance in cellular terms. And so here are some examples. We have cytosolic sharing, as I've already mentioned, through gap junctions, very, very short distance. We even have situations of self-signaling. We call this paradigm autocrine. Whereas paracrine, and this is nearly paracrine, but it's just cytoplasmic sharing, so gap junctions one cell or less than one cell diameter. This is the same cell. Or we can have, say, more than five to 10 cell diameters. That's what we call endocrine, a diffusible signal that moves more than five to 10 cell diameters. So gap junctions in human cells, like for instance, our cardiac uh, contractile cells have gap junctions. Some neurons do, but not very many. In plants, you could have these plasmodesmata between plant cells that allow for cytoplasmic sharing. You can also have um, paracrine type signaling, very, very short distance, what we call contact dependent signaling. So these have to have a physical contact. The, the signal is on the cell surface of one cell and the receptor is on the cell surface of another cell, leading to a response in that cell.
It's very, very common that we see this in the immune system. This is very, a very common situation. The book uses the term local regulators. Basically, these are diffusible signals that travel very, very short distances, very short different distances. Hormones can do it, but there are also a class of molecules called cytokines, but uh, uh, that's for a late, you know, another lecture. So very, very short diffusing signals, uh, paracrine situation. Long distance signaling, the, the canonical phrase or the canonical word is hormones, but that's not the only story. Those cytokines are also long distance, but we're not going to talk about those. So we have these local mediators, these local regulators that travel very short distances, and we have molecules capable of long distance signaling that we call hormones. Hormones are what we most of us are familiar with when it comes to a chemical message that can move throughout the body. The thing is, and I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in, in your understanding here, but here's the thing. When it comes to endocrine disorders, we either have syndromes of too much hormone or we have syndromes of too little hormone. And if you don't have a receptor on the appropriate or what is meant to be a target cell, you would have a syndrome of too little hormone. Even though you might have boatloads of hormone, it may not get the response because you don't have a receptor. If a cell has a receptor, we will usually see a response in that cell. So here's a nice picture. We have the secreting cell. This might be an endocrine cell, like in your pituitary secretes a molecule out into the extracellular fluid that can diffuse into the bloodstream all throughout the body and then diffuse out of the bloodstream into tissues where it will interact with receptors on target cells. Paracrine and synaptic are shown here in the nice big picture, but they're both paracrine. It's just that synaptic is generally talking about faster, kinetic, faster diffusion kinetics. If you were to hold your hands together like you were praying, like in a prayer position, that would still be not that would still be more distance than what we see in the distance between uh, a neuron and its target cell. Very, a very, very close association with neurons and target cells. Here's just another big picture of the endocrine cell. It's a diffusible signal, diffuses into the extracellular fluid, eventually into the bloodstream, through the bloodstream, out into the extracellular fluid, binding targets, whether on the cell surface or sometimes way down in the nucleus of a cell. Steroid hormones, like for instance, testosterone and estrogen, are, diff are very diffusible. They get into the bloodstream, they diffuse out into the tissues, and they diffuse all the way into the nucleus of a cell where they bind their receptors. And this is just a, an extra slide I threw in here showing you an example. Like, for instance, here's acetylcholine, can bind receptors. This is actually a neurotransmitter. It binds a receptor, and we have different kinds of acetylcholine receptors. Or in the case of hormones, like for instance, epinephrine and norepinephrine, different kinds of receptors. And these different receptors lead to different kinds of responses in the tissues. You'll learn more about this in physiology if you uh, take um, Bio 330 or Bio 331. Again, just to help you show that there's a larger world out here, but we can sort of dial it down for now. So while there was some understanding that there were these molecules that moved through the body that could cause responses, nobody was really able to um, identify how the cells could recognize the presence of a hormone, like for instance, insulin or epinephrine, until, uh, until the mid 20th century, when a researcher at uh, Vanderbilt, Dr. Earl Sutherland, um, showed um, how there was a receptor on the surface of the cell that created internal molecules, in this case cyclic AMP and so forth, leading to protein responses. So Earl Southern was the one who really laid down the three stages of cell signaling. So he discovered epinephrine and he discovered the adrenergic receptor. And so he saw that there was a receptor. So he had through this first process of reception, transduction, that there was a second message, some sort of a signal inside the cells. In this case, it was cyclic AMP, cyclic adenosine monophosphate, that led to the changes in protein behavior, the response. 
And so here's how it sort of worked. He had the signaling molecule, in the case of Dr. Sutherland's example, it was epinephrine, that bound a receptor, which he later called the adrenergic receptor. And then you get these relay molecules. In this case, the molecule that was created, some molecules don't have to be created, they just have to be turned on. But other molecules have to be created, and that's the transduction step. Either you're turning on proteins, or you're creating molecules that turn on and turn off proteins, or both, you know, that sort of a thing. In any case, cyclic AMP changing the behavior of proteins leading to a cellular response. And again, it can be a fast response, a cytosolic response, or it can be a slow genetic response. So let's talk about reception a little bit. We'll talk about reception and receptors. When we have a signal molecule, oftentimes that signal molecule is referred to as a ligand or a ligand. I like ligand. Ligand is more used in the UK and, and, and that sort of a thing, but ligand in the United States. And this is very specific. We don't want to be responding to signals that are fake, right? We want to, we want to respond to the real deal. So we have very specific interactions between the ligand and the receptor. When that ligand binds the receptor, it changes the shape of the receptor. Um, think, about, um, think about baseball or softball. When there's a ball flying through the air and the person's about to catch it, that glove is open, but as soon as that ball gets in there, the glove closes. And that's kind of what's happening with these proteins, that that interaction changes the shape of the receptor, which leads, a ch leads to a change in its behavior. Most receptors we have that we uh, deal with, most are in the plasma membrane. That, but not all, most. Again, that's the fun part of biology is that you can't hardly ever say 100%. So receptors in the plasma membrane are designed to receive signal from outside the cell most of the time. And a lot of those signals are going to be water soluble, we say hydrophilic. A few receptors are sensitive to hydrophobic molecules. There are testosterone receptors on the plasma membrane surface, but there are also testosterone membrane, uh, receptors way, way down deep inside the cell. But if it's water soluble, you can, you know, if it's it's hydrophilic signal, you can bet money that the receptor is going to be on the plasma surface and it's going to span the plasma membrane. That then you can you can bet money on that. And here are some examples. We have three main type. We actually have four, but we're going to talk about three in this chapter. We have the fun one, the G protein coupled receptor, seven transmembrane domains, it's got seven spans across the membrane. They used to call it a serpentine receptor because of the way it zigzagged through the plasma membrane. And it's coupled to a G protein. That's why we call it a G protein coupled receptor. We have receptor enzymes. In this case, we're going to talk about receptor tyrosine kinase. It's an enz a specific type of enzyme that phosphorylates a specific type of target. We're going to break that out and get, let you uh, get familiar with the tyrosine kinase, the RTKs. And then we have channel receptors. We call these gated channels. These channels typically will open and close in response to the presence or absence of a ligand. Uh, in the case of like, for instance, this one right here, this is a GABA receptor. When we have a, a GABA molecule binds here, it will cause this ion channel to open and we let chloride into the cell. It's an ion channel receptor, sometimes called ionotropic, but that's not a term I'm going to hold you to. So GPCRs, G protein coupled receptors, RTKs, receptor tyrosine kinases, and ion channel receptors. And this is not in your book, but I would definitely, definitely spend some time with this figure. And here's our fourth category over here. This is called an integrin. An integrin can react with extracellular matrix, with proteins and glycoproteins outside the cell, help tell a cell that it's in the right place. We're not going to talk about it in, the, in, this, uh, in this discussion, but we are going to talk about channel receptors, receptor enzymes, in the case we're going to talk about receptor tyrosine kinases, and our G protein coupled receptors. So GPCRs, largest family of cell surface receptors. 
largest family that's because they allow us to change the seven transmembrane domain without changing the interior um, architecture so all you have to do is change the 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 the, uh, the receptor and the downstream stuff can stay the same it's the largest family it's also the most druggable target two-thirds of our current drugs in our in our uh, Pharmacopoeia are GPCR modulators, usually GPCR inhibitors. And so here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven transmembrane domains. You can spot it from a mile away. And what happens is, is that seven transmembrane, that's the receptor, that's what we can vary. This stuff down here, this is the G protein that we are coupled to. So here is the receptor domain, and here is the G protein that serves to convey a second message when the receptor is activated. So here's the short story. So here's our G protein. It's got different subunits, and they, they study this intensely because there's lots of possible ways of, of, of manipulating this with drugs. But in any case, what happens is when the when the receptor is not stimulated, that G protein is usually bound to that receptor, and it has GDP to it. So the guanosine diphosphate. It's like an it's like an ATP, but it's G instead of A, and it only has two phosphates rather than three. So it's bound to the receptor and it is inactive. So when we have GDP there. The, the G protein is inactive and bound to the receptor. And so here's another picture of it here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We don't see the G protein here. We have the binding site for the signal out here. We have the G protein interacting uh, areas down here. And this doesn't show it very well, but usually this G protein is a little more associated with that G protein coupled receptor, and they're showing it as a blob rather than the seven transmembranes. But when we don't have a ligand here, this GDP is associated with the G protein, and it's inactive. It's turned off. But as soon as we bind a ligand, that receptor facilitates the exchange of GTP replacing the GDP. So when we to turn this protein on, we have to get GTP on there and kick GDP off. And the receptor facilitates that. Okay? So the receptor is serving as an exchange factor to get GTP on there. And as soon as GTP is on there, now that, now that G protein is active. It's the second message now. This is the first message. And now this activated G protein is the second message. This is the intracellular, this is the transduce, transduction. We transduce the signal into an active GT, uh, G protein that can then interact with other enzymes and turn on responses. This is serving as a modulator of other proteins leading to cellular responses. Eventually though, we have to turn this pathway off. And, and one of the tricks in biology is understanding that it's just as important to turn things off as it is to turn things on. You have to breathe out. Breathing out is just as important as breathing in, right? Heart relaxation is just important as contraction. We have to relax in order to have beats. And the same thing is true in signaling. We have to turn these things off. So we're gonna turn it on it's going to create a signal, but eventually, after maybe a few seconds or sometimes a little longer, that GTP gets hydrolyzed into GDP again, kicking off that inorganic phosphate. And when that happens, when that hydrolysis occurs, this protein goes back to an inactive state. So we turn it on and then we turn it off. Never forget that. Remember that we live in between on and off on for a period of time, then we turn it back off. Our next receptor is called a receptor tyrosine kinase. A kinase is a type of enzyme. So we have a receptor that has enzymatic activity. A kinase is an enzyme that takes ATP, takes that gamma phosphate off of that ATP and transfers it onto a tyrosine amino acid on its target.
So we're taking the gamma phosphate from ATP, transferring it onto a tyrosine amino acid on a protein target, a specific protein target. Um, there are only three or four amino acids out there that we can actually phosphorylate. We can phosphorylate serine and threonine, and we can phosphorylate tyrosine. And we're going to focus on tyrosine because it has special roles in, in signal transduction. Tyrosine kinases actually, once they're activated, they phosphorylate themselves, and that allows for multiple signaling pathways to occur at once. That's because many RTKs are involved in um, uh, cell growth and division. They receive a signal that says, hey, we need to, we need to grow and divide, like, for instance, in inflammation is a pro-cell division signal. So we get this inflammatory signal that causes these RTKs to become active, and it's going to trigger cells to begin dividing. And But dividing isn't just splitting in two. You have to duplicate the, the DNA. You have to duplicate certain organelles. You have to mobilize the plasma membrane. you got a lot to do when you're going to divide. So you have multiple signaling pathways. And that's the beauty of RTKs is it can show us some of that possibility. RTKs are often associated with many types of cancers. Why? Because many of our pro-growth and division signals come through receptor tyrosine kinases. We've even cured um, certain types of um, uh, cancers by blocking specific types of, of signaling in RTK pathways. And so let's go through the basic steps. I've got some animations here. We're going to, this will be our final topic for this lecture. So here's our signaling molecule. And this is a molecule, uh, insulin does this, but other growth factor molecules can do this as well. So we bind, the ligand binds the, the binding site on a receptor tyrosine kinase. Usually it takes two because what happens is when those when those ligands bind, the receptor forms a complex we call a dimer. Dimers are two. A tetramer would be four. But in this case, we have two receptors dimerizing, and they cross phosphorylate each other. They call this autophosphorylation of the dimer, but I'm not going to go there too much. So this monomer over here is going to phosphorylate these tyrosines. And this monomer over here is going to phosphorylate these tyrosines. Requires some ATPs. We've got six of them here. And so we're going to phosphorylate six different uh, sites to in total. Three on one monomer and three on the other. You guys know the, uh, the, the red carpet analogy that uh, when you want to have people come into your store or your hotel, you roll out the red carpet. That's kind of what's going on here. These dimers, when they are not phosphorylated, are kind of tightly balled up. And that phosphorylation event causes them to kind of open up and kind of like rolling out the red carpet for other proteins to bind. So you roll out the red carpet and now these proteins can recognize these phosphotyrosines and become activated by the by the receptor to cause responses. Usually there are multiple targets. You got at least six here, which means that you might have you know at least two or more different proteins binding and getting activated. Reception, second message, response. Okay, same story as always. And I have this animated here. I have this animated. So we have our receptor tyrosine kinases here. Here's our ligands. They bind and dimerize. So we have the kinase domain inside, the hormone binding site outside, and here are those growth factors. They bind and we get the dimerization. Once they've dimerized, they will then cross phosphorylate each other. The kinase domains will trigger phosphorylation on tyrosine amino acids on the opposite monomer. Like I said, rolling out the red carpet for protein interaction. And here come some proteins. This one, these are called grab two and sauce. They recognize the phosphotyrosine and the amino acids around that particular site. Maybe another protein will bind another set of uh, uh, phosphotyrosines in another location. Once that grab two sauce binds, 
that grab to sauce can then mediate other signals, whether it's in the cytosol or maybe to an organelle, a fast cytosolic response, or a slow genetic response in the nucleus. Either way, though, receptor tyrosine kinases are very, very good at triggering multiple pathways simultaneously with just one first message. And we can extend this. So here's a receptor tyrosine kinase, and then we can get a second message. In this case, we have a series of kinases. And I like to say series of kinases because these kinases aren't tyrosines. They are serine and threonine kinases, but not to worry too much. This is sort of the downstream signal. Maybe we do some fast cytosolic responses, like to mobilize the plasma membrane or to duplicate organelles or, you know, that sort of a thing, or we can phosphorylate some sort of a transcription factor that then causes it to bind DNA and change the uh, the, the uh, proteins that are expressed, maybe to duplicate the chromosome, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to stop right there for part A, but I want you to notice something in this figure that you saw at the beginning. Hey, look, there's a receptor tyrosine kinase. Hey, look, there's a GPCR, and there's another GPCR, and another one and another receptor tyrosine kinase. Just that much you can begin to see. So here's our first message, like a survival factor. Here's our receptor. Here's our signal transduction, maybe a kinase cascade leading to some kind of a response, apoptosis. Or perhaps a growth factor, again, receptor tyrosine kinase. Oh, there's grab 2 sauce that I mentioned in our animation. Serine threonine kinases leading to gene regulation, slow genetic response. GPCRs in the G protein leading to creation of a second message that can then lead to gene uh, so forth. You have learned so much in this figure already if you just take the time to learn the terminology, focus on what we've talked about in our class, and you're well on your way to understanding the, something that could be incredibly intimidating to anybody who hasn't had a class like this. So good luck. Thanks for your time. And I will uh, see you in part B. Thanks again.